Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Matt, Dan, and Sam rejoining us to kind of break down these markets, look at the supply chain, a lot going on right now. Matt, let's start off with the demand side. I mean, there are some concerns when it comes to demand. We've seen corn exports pick up a little bit, but is it at the pace that we need to even hit USDA's numbers right now? You know, not necessarily. I mean, they've, they extracted more demand, of course, uh, export demand on this January report, kind of moving in the right direction. I felt like they took a little bigger bite than maybe some folks thought that they would take as far as that report was concerned, but I think it's certainly justified. I think moving forward, you know, if China does not come in for U.S. corn, uh, we're going to have a bit of an issue uh, still reaching the USDA goal. So, you know, I'm not totally convinced that uh, 1242 is going to be your final number on, on carry. You know, corn usage for ethanol has picked back up a little bit after a little bit of a doldrums, if you will, uh, but I'm still a little bit concerned there as well, because profit margins, especially in the areas with their corn deficit, they have really had to bid up for corn, and that's really cut into margins. China, big question mark about China, Dan. I mean, we have not seen China come in. One, in the short term, do you think we will see China come into our markets uh, yet this marketing year? And two, with the population drop that they just acknowledged, it, does that worry you when it comes to soybean demand longer term? I, uh, so the Chinese, as uh, they are bidding today, there's something called TRQ, which is tariff rate quotas, and they can buy, this is to the private companies, and some of that may have come from U.S. corn, but I don't think it's going to be more than a million or two tons. Sinograin and Kafka, the two government buyers, are likely to buy either Ukrainian or Brazilian corn. They just approved Brazilian corn back late last year. So as I'm looking around, I think the Chinese will focus on those two sellers. There may be a little bit of U.S. demand, so I'm not hopeful that there's a bullish, uh, let's say, surprise from China uh, for U.S. corn. What worries me longer term, time is that if you look at the hog herd that China has today and the efficiencies that are coming from being more westernized, they may not need as many soybeans going forward. So we think about a world where soybeans demand to China is now between between 92 and 100 for many years, that growth factor that used to be there may not be there anymore, which is something as we expand in South America is a concern. Sam, when, when you look at China and you look at them opening back up and what that means for the supply chain, I mean, last year that was the big news when we look at some of the active ingredients that we were missing and that was coming from China. So now seeing China come back online, that production, hopefully getting that product out, where does that help in the supply chain? Uh, I think it kind of helps across the panoply of farm inputs products, inclusive of phosphates and urea and nitrogen products as well, as they seem to probably be likely to export a little bit more onto the global market as well. Um, with the ag chem side, this is a story which has quite a long lead time to really materialize, but it's also attached to supply chains, costs of freight, which are always coming down, or increasingly coming down. So I think it's a, it's a pressure relief with what's going on in China. Um, but um, you can't discount the ability for things to be corrected quite quickly with a command economy. And we don't really know how the COVID issue in China is going to play out um, and how that could be, um, how you could see a rather immediate impact on certain parts of the farm inputs value chain as well. Dan, a year ago we were talking about, okay, what if we do see Russia invade Ukraine and how that scenario would play out? Well, we all know how it played out. And still now, as that is very much top of mind and how we're seeing it readjust world trade, what are you watching for 2023 and what impact do you think it could have on our commodity markets? Well, I think uh, as we think about Russia and Ukraine, let's first point out that even though there is a war, Russian Ukrainian wheat exports are only a million tons below the record, which is shocking when we think back to what we thought back last March or April. So when we look forward, I do believe Ukraine is going to have a production problem. I think they'll be lucky to get 40% of a wheat crop, uh, maybe 50, 60% of corn or sunflower. Price of uh, diesel fuel today in Ukraine is $30 a gallon. So when you think about how that plays into the farm mindset, they are not going to be planting crops. Now, the unknown is Russia. The reason that Ukrainian uh, Russian Black Sea exports combined was all about Russia. We, if they have good crops, that'll help mend that. But I will tell you that I think the wheat market, maybe you need to be a little attention because of Ukraine losses as we turn the calendar to new crop, maybe in April and May. 
All right, Matt, so we've talked about a lot. There's still a lot of uncertainty when it comes to fertilizer prices, when it comes to input prices as a whole, but what do you want to leave farmers with here as they head home in 2023? Well, I think there's a bit of a pendulum swift, uh, shift, if you will, whenever it comes to profit margins, and I think we all need to understand that we've got a fair amount invested. If we're honest about it, most of us bought fertilizer last fall. It was pretty expensive fertilizer, and unfortunately, if we didn't sell corn or hedge our risk in some capacity as far as corn prices were concerned, right? now your margins are as tight as they've been in years, but that doesn't mean they're not going to get tighter or go, to what, go away altogether. So we have to understand that uh, right now, it, it certainly looks like managing risk could be one of the best things you can do. Sitting on your hands, I don't advise in, in any way, shape, or form. Matt, Dan, Sam, thank you so much for joining us this weekend. Let's take a quick break, and then we have much more on U.S. Farm Report.